Hi there, it's Dr. Jeff Pierce from Michigan Sports and Spine, and guess what? We made it to to 20, episode 20. And Nicole has told me, don't sidetrack right out of the gate. So I'm going to anyhow. No, I mean, it's, it's been encouraging. We've watched the numbers. I, I've learned a lot about social media. I've learned, you know, the do's and don'ts of social media, because I always talk about the do's and don'ts of your spine and what you should and shouldn't be doing. And it's also the do's and don'ts of social, uh, social media. So it's like, get your chest up, don't get a double chin. You know, make sure you have the thing higher. You're not looking down at it. It's looking down, up to you. And uh, it's actually motivated me to work out so I look a little bit better because I have to sit here and look at myself the whole time. So it's, it's definitely fun. Uh, we took some of the comments on what we should be doing for this time. Um, but we're, we're going to skip them because I think everybody's having a lot of fun out there and I appreciate it to have fun on uh, my behalf. Um, I will not be doing some of the things that were suggested. So let's jump into it. I'm sure I'll sidetrack at some point um, on some subjects that's going on. Um, probably the big thing is, if everybody knows about my daughter, she actually came home from Colorado uh, because of quarantine. So they were shut down for three weeks for, for mostly everybody has to stay in their dorm rooms. So she decided to come home. So that's a huge uh, benefit for, for me personally, but I think she's, it's sad. And it's not just my daughter, it's all these kids over the, you know, graduating high school, moving into college. It's just some of the things that are being missed that are just so much fun and experiences in life. But we will all gain strength from this. And we all, I just talked about this with someone else, no matter what it is, there's always a positive. And if you take a positive attitude, there's not that too many negatives in this year. Um, so we need to find the positives from what's going on this year. It is the craziest year of my adult life of uh, 50 plus years. So we need to, uh, we're, we're always going to find what the positives are. So that's what, it's actually what we're doing. That's what then Nicole's pushing for the theme for today is, you know, it's really about let's, let's get started today. Let's not push anything off. Let's highly motivate and, and see what we can do. It's not just, I pushed heavy last week and Nicole warned me not to do it today, but it, I think it is the message because when I sit there and I turn on CNN and Fox and all this, there's nothing about staying healthy. It's really about staying healthy. The one thing I left off last week is it's not just wearing masks. It's not about um, the six feet. It's not just about washing hands. All three of those things, hugely important. The CDC can't be ignored and what they're doing. They're trying to create for the masses. And when we just tear it down to one individual or one situation, it's not always fair to them because they're trying to create a solution for the masses. Sometimes we can create a little solution here in our office and we have more controls than they do. But again, the point is I want to push healthy living and healthy, healthy lifestyle. Again, real quick sleep, wake cycles, proper nutrition, have some fruit every day, you know, do your multivitamin, whatever you need to do, what you feel better and healthy. And to be honest, for the people that have been listening to me, and there's one person out there that maybe she is listening to me, she reminds me that I, she was a poorly controlled diabetic. She was overweight. She was with back pain. Um, I talked to her about healthy living, a healthy lifestyle, you know, eliminating meats, uh, red meat especially. And she sits here and she talked to my staff just on Monday that the deal was that I would do the same. I lasted a week and I think she's entering her third year and feels better than ever. So. I will admit though, I didn't follow it to a T, but I've definitely have cut down tremendously. And I do feel, I feel better when I'm on that stricter diet and nutrition, I watch my nutrition. So getting into question one, I've been ex exercising outside since quarantine started. I'm not a gym person. Do you have any recommendations for me since it's getting colder outside? So that's something, and it's a great leading question because that's something that's going to be an issue. It's going to be an issue with the gyms have open. Um, it's what you can do in the house. So people love to be outside. They like for myself, it's, I have energy. I have, I have to do something. I have to, you've heard me. I have to bike. I have to kayak. I have to do something outside or I just don't feel right. So I'm assuming you've heard me talk about that. It's going to be hard to replace. I mean, obviously the weather is beautiful today. Today's not an example of that. But when you get to colder, it's, it's things you can do outside. Now we're not talking about snowfall, but we're talking about 
you know, bundle up. You can put more clothes on. You still can, you know, walk outside, run outside, bike outside. You know, it, it's the other stuff. It's doing squats outside. It's doing the lunges. It's not just what I used to talk about going for walks. Don't just walk. You know, do a lunge every five steps. You do a lunge or do 10 lunges in a row or do a side step or walk in reverse. If you just walk and you have a short step walk, you're not really doing a, a complete exercise. You're spending the time to do it. Take advantage of that time. So you want to switch it up. You want to be able to switch it up for outside. Um, so I don't know how active you are. I mean, definitely bundle up if it gets warmer. Be, and if you're really truly exercising, like my buddy said, the pool's cold, but after the second lap, it warms up because your body's warming up. You actually will appreciate that little cooler, cooler environment because you can actually do more. When you're in a very hot environment, 80 degrees plus, it actually will run your heart rate up for different reasons, not because you're conditioning and exercising. You're getting sweaty and everything for, because of the climate outside. But if you can actually build up that sweat, the cold sweat is sometimes the best sweat. If you, know, if you understand what I mean, it's like when it's 50, 60 degrees or 40, 50 degrees and your body's actually producing it. So my son's in his new eighth grade science and he talked to me about, explained to me the science of shivering. Shivering is actually an activity that accelerates metabolism in your body because your body, that's the way your body um, keeps your um, warmth. So you're building that up. So overall, what do I have for you for recommendations of getting colder? It's the same thing as right now. Right now, we're not into winter. We'll talk later about winter because we're, we're not bringing snow up right now. But I, I, the, we're going to have great weather. The weather is great today. Get out and exercise. And that's the thing. It's like, don't wait till tomorrow. because we, we live in Michigan. Get out today. Don't make the excuse. I'm rushing home to, to get back on my bike. I haven't been on my bike in a couple of days. So it's important to do it. Um, if you do, if it is just to a walk, you can always walk no matter what the temperature, unless you're in a blizzard. And some people like blizzards. But you can still do the walk where, again, don't just walk. You know, you can lunge 10 times. You can uh, change your stride every once in a while. Do a scissor step. Do a backward step. Do side steps. And where all that stuff works on your balance and your feedback system. So um, overall, that's what you need to do. If you have any further questions, we'd be happy to talk to you in person. Question two, is there ever an instance where you can't benefit from rehabilitation pertaining to my right knee? So rehabilitation, when we talk about therapy, should always be beneficial. If there's like a, an acute injury, if there's a complete tear, if you're pushing against um, a lock, what we call a bucket handle tear in your knee, it's, it's pushing and you're grinding against it. Sometimes people say, well, I have bone on bone and I, don't, and I was told not to do therapy. Absolutely not. You definitely can benefit from a therapist. You have to have a more educated therapist to be able to work with you. There's always working with the core, the core strength of your body, the core strength of your quadriceps, your hamstrings, when you're talking about your knee. So is there ever an instance? The word ever is so 100% absolute. Yes, there are, instance, uh, there are times where you're going to potentially damage it. That's if that, that meniscus is getting is getting stuck and it locks out your knee. A lot of times a good therapist will create a little bit more of motion to, re, to relax it and relieve it. But for the most part, therapy should help. If you're talking about physical therapy, if you're talking about uh, home exercise we talk about, you talk about a program, it should always be in your benefit. If it's actually hurting you, you have to see a doctor because it should not be painful. So there should always be a, a way to get around that. Um, and sometimes you're just, you know, like I said, not all therapists are created equal, not all physicians are created equal. So you may want to think about moving on or getting a second opinion with that. So question three, I have a herniated disc, but I don't feel I received enough information from my current doctor. It's to my understanding that these herniations are described by their size. Bulges is small, protrusion is slightly larger, and extrusion is big. Can you confirm these terms and the severity of each? So to give you the general answer that I've been lecturing to all my residents and fellows and everything else, and to my patients, that is not necessarily true. A bulge is not something that's necessarily small. 
it all varies, okay? So to understand, we always use the, the, the inner tube, the old inner tube for your bicycle. A bulge is where there's an outpocketing on that area, a little bubble on it. And that bubble, depending on how your anatomy is or where it's placed, can cause more pain than an extruded disc. So it doesn't relate to size, it doesn't relate to quality of discomfort. On a whole, these, these things in a general simplistic way are accurate. So again, we're talking about a, a bulge, which is small. So a bulge is actually can, is smaller than a, a protrusion because the protrusion is already open. It's more of the involvement. So you think of the, so we're talking about the disc, my handy spine, front, back, bone, disc. So when we're talking about this disc, it's made up of something called an annulus. And an annulus is the meshwork to hold it in. So when you're talking about that, any one of these, there's some loss of integrity of the, of the matrix of the annulus in the disc. So again, it's a, some disruption of the annulus, which is the matrix that holds the disc together. So when the bulge is out, it, again, going back to the inner tube, it's an outpocketing. It's not disrupted. It's still holding the air in or in this case, the disc fluid, but it's bulging out into an area that's not making it as efficient. A protrusion is where it's actually pushed out into the area and there could be some disruption. An extruded disc is basically that the disc has opened up and has fallen out and gone to a different space. So all of these can be asymptomatic and can be severely symptomatic. It's where the clinical picture lies in comparison. So it's not like you just take this and this equals that. You have to have a physician or a therapist, but more so a physician to get down to the clinical picture. I just had a great example of a friend who he freaked out because his MRI looked terrible. He had an extruded disc, but he didn't clinically show up like that. So he has a very generous canal to allow this disc to still live within the canal. It's all about space. It's all about how much space you have in that area. So if you look again at our spine, if we look at it this way, this is looking at you as if you're laying on your stomach. This is the bone part, this is the back. This is the disc. These are the discs that pinch on the spinal cord. Everything has to live in these small environments that we have, with these small little openings. If I take this disc and I flatten it, which is an aging process, this opening here becomes compromised. Well, if you compromise that opening just a little bit with a little bit of a bulge, and a little bit of arthritis on here, you get you know, the trifecta of, of, of a complex problem. So the, the clinical picture always has to be addressed. When you sit there and it's, I say, well, my buddy has a, a herniated disc and he's okay and I just have this minor stuff and I can't walk around, again, it's your clinical picture. And sometimes you're born with a spine that has smaller, smaller openings. And you have acquired or if you've you know, like I had one lady here a couple days ago. She's like, well, I fell as a kid. I fell really hard on my tailbone. I had another woman that bounced down 11 steps. That causes that axial load, that shifting, which creates a problem, which kind of starts that little cascade of what we call osteoarthritis, or I have um, bone spurs. All that stuff adds up when we're talking about openings where the nerves come out. So again, when you say confirm these turns and the severity of each, I confirm the terms, hopefully. The severity has to go along with the anatomy and the clinical picture. Like I have people that have discs that are terrible and their clinical pictures, they're touching their toes, they're rotating every way, they're golfing four days a week, but every once in a while I wake up achy. That's a mechanical thing. That's something else we need to work on. We don't go to surgery because you have a large disc. We go to surgery because the clinical picture matches what's going on. There's some doctors and I've been told the stories like, oh my God, you need surgery or you're gonna, you're gonna be paralyzed because of the size of it. I, I, I don't appreciate that, I don't agree with it. And I think that needs to be, again, put in the clinical picture. Now, if you have severe, where you're losing bowel and bladder, where you're feeling numbness and tingling to your, ar your, your arms or your legs in this case, or you just feel unbalanced, those are red flags that we, we have to be more serious and more concerned. But again, you have to get to a physician that can be able to deal with that and understand it. I just talked to an individual right before I came on here. She wasn't confident in what the physician was telling her. And sometimes I find that the, the, sometimes we say keywords and then they shut down and stop listening. 
so they don't listen to the rest. Like sometimes when I say you need an injection, they will like, they can't hear anything else after I say that. So sometimes we need to be more, you know, in, it's astute to under, making sure they understand. So I usually end every session now with, do you have any further questions? Do you understand what we just talked about? And sometimes I spend a little bit more time in the room and then I get pegged for spending too much time and then I fall behind, but that's a whole nother story. So moving on to question four, what is the proper therapy for concussion? So again, I, I appreciate the question, but it's very general. We talk about concussion multiple ways. Concussion from when I finished school and residency and became you know, my first few years of physician as to now, I haven't changed much, but the world has changed tremendously in, in the acknowledgement of it. I think, you know, I don't want to blame NFL football or football, but it was always like you were weak or you were, you know, you can't, you can't come out. You know, it was the smelling salts. It was whatever you needed to do to wake them up and get them back in. Your bell got rung, all that. So all that's being changed where I was aware of it back then because of how much hockey, you know, I took care of a ton of hockey kids with the AAA hockey and everything we did and us being in the Troy Sports Center right above, just we naturally had a lot of, a lot of kids for hockey. So we were very aggressive because these were of younger ages. So the younger ages don't always recognize what's going on. And I'm talking about, you know, eight year olds um, up to 18 years of age. You know, you start getting concussions then, you know, it affects your schoolwork, it affects the way you are through life. I mean, it's just, it's a battery of things that you need to be aware of. And we took a very aggressive stand, got back in 19, I won't even say it, late 90s, early 2000, a, a very aggressive stand, which I feel is just coming up to the up to par. And, you know, we have concussion protocols. We watch guys walk off the field, assisted, they go into this tent. You know, all that's, all that's great. So concussions are so varied right now. And the, the thing that's really been a big deal is that concussion isn't just an impact injury. It's a movement injury. It's, it's the brain being shifted into a, into a very close shell. That's what our skull is. And it moves back and forth so you can get bruising without ever, ever having a concussion. Especially like in whiplashes and car accidents, is which we've pushed, and I've talked to some of the, the top lawyers to understand that, that, you know, the other side is saying, you know, there was no, there was no uh, injury to the head. There was no, you didn't hit the dashboard. You didn't hit the windshield. It's the actual movement and the velocity of the movement that helps you because with the seatbelts, you're being pulled in. So the seatbelt actually works as a positive and a negative. When that seatbelt holds you in and your whole body's going forward, it's not holding your head in place. Your head's flying forward and it's flying back and it's, you know, back in the day, we didn't have headrest. That was the big thing for a headrest is to take on that, that blow. The headrest isn't there for you to really lay. It's there to protect you in case of an injury, uh, of an accident. So there's a lot of anatomy, there's a lot of dynamics, there's a lot of physiology, um, just throwing some big terms out there, but um, to understand it. So to answer your question, what is the proper therapy? I mean, it's everything from staying, staying home for a couple of days, you know, um, icing, taking it easy, to full-blown traumatic brain injuries where you're at you know, one of the universities or downtown getting treatment, but it's all, what well, we talk about cognitive. Cognitive is your thought process. You have to make sure that's okay. We go through headaches. Everybody knows about, well, I'm not throwing up and I'm not, and the lights kind of bother me, but I can still get through it. Those are mild concussions. When you're throwing up and the lights are bothering, you can't open your eyes, you can't think straight, then those are, are, are more severe. But overall, in general, you need a good assessment, especially with Dr. Bonat here, who feels very confident and comfortable with, with concussions you know, you need to be evaluated. If you have any ideas, you know, and sometimes you don't realize it. You don't realize how involved you are. Sometimes you need someone around you. It's like, you're just acting off. You're not, you're not yourself. You're not remembering things. Like, why did you forget this? Um, you've been doing this for years. It's your routine. All these things are red flag for milder concussions. The, the bad ones are easy. You need major treatment. Um, you need medications. You need um, therapy. You need possibly occupational therapy, speech therapy. There's a lot of things we do. So this is a pretty broad question. And I don't know if I, I can't answer it simply, I'm sorry, but there's just such a range to treat. 
you know, when I talk about sports injuries, we talk about being hit from behind and all that. Those are the things we need to address. And there's sometimes there's some mechanical things where I've, I'm telling you, we've evaluated, we fixed neck injuries, which takes the back, the, the headaches away and the concussion symptoms. So tough question. I'm sorry if I didn't get to the exact answer you're looking for. So question five, I have some pain in my low back that has recently gotten worse. Pain level is four to six out of 10. I'm not comfortable going to a doctor's office yet because of COVID. So is there anything I can do in the meantime outside of stretching? So this is a real simple one. We do telemedicine, so we'll do everything over the phone. We've actually gotten really good at it. To, I, I have you kind of go through an exam. There's certain tricks that we can do to if it elicits certain dif discomforts where I feel comfortable. If it's not doing it, then we can go with a simple, simple program at home. We do include a lot of yoga. We include, include a lot of stretching. We, we talk about mechanics. We talk about the way your room's set up. And a lot of these people are those that are having it are the ones that are uncomfortable leaving and they're at the computer all day. That's a big, big problem because you're sitting all day. I, I think I talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Basically at work, it's like, oh, I had a meeting or I had this or I had to go to the bathroom. I had to, you know, so I was up and down throughout the hour. Now it's like I just sit on the phone, I sit on the computer and I'm sitting, you know, before you know it, eight to 10 hours a day. That's the biggest no-no. No so sometimes it's just us seeing what you're doing at home, which has been a big benefit for our telemedicine because I'm seeing you in your environment. It makes me understand a little bit better what you, what barriers you may have, may hurdles you have, but it's been a huge, a huge um, success for us with the telemedicine in those regards. I mean, I'm talking to people from all around the country now and getting them set up and at least on a program. So yes, there's a ton you can do. We can do a telemedicine or you can do a telemedicine evaluation. If it's back pain, I would definitely pick someone like myself or in the same field that feels confident and comfortable. But not all docs will put you through some of the routine questions that we do and some of the positioning. You know, they look at me like, what do you want me to do? And I, and I get them set up and then they kind of understand after we're done. But again, I'm looking for like, well, that didn't bother me. Well, you know, they look at me like, why'd you make me do this type of thing? But overall, yeah, telemedicine we can definitely do. Stretching is definitely important. What I've said for a lot of people is Google yoga for beginners or free flow, free flow yoga for the body is huge. If you look at our stuff, we have some virtual uh, teams that we work with, with the yoga that's been put out and we're gonna put more of those things out through our email. So sign up for our Facebook, sign up for our emails, sign up for our Instagram, because we're trying to share all that stuff. So overall, it's important, like I said, I mean, anybody who knows me or listens to me, it's like, stay active. Like my, one of my good friends is like, he wanted to start taking medicines. Like, why don't you do it? He goes, I just, I, I love your philosophy about you know, less is more. And it is, if you stay healthy, if you're proactive, if you're staying active at all, you're gonna need less meds. Don't go to a doctor as first thing is like, here's a medication. We give medications, but it's for a purpose. You know, make sure you understand the purpose and take it on you. You know, like we said at the beginning, it's like we, we put a lot on you. A lot of times I'll sit there and I'll talk to the patient. I'm, I, I'm here to educate you and you need to make the decisions, you know, from what I'm saying, what you can and can't do. You've got to be realistic with yourself. So concussion protocols, again, we're, we, we do that all the time. If it's severe, we get you to different types of doctors for most of the mild stuff and, and athletic stuff or, or auto injuries or work injuries, we can handle it, especially with Dr. Bonet here. We're taking on a whole new set of, of individuals with headaches. He enjoys doing that, God bless him. Um, but he can, he can definitely handle it and he's available right away. There's usually sometimes you can, do, uh, there's usually something you can always do, take control of your physical health. So again, you know, that's what we do. I'm not here to hold your hand. I'm not here to, to, to be at your house. I'm here to educate you and encourage you of what you do. Hopefully lead by example also, but for the most part, you need to take charge of your life. If, if COVID hasn't set you back and being able to reevaluate what you're doing, I don't know what's gonna happen in this world to make you do it. So mm -hmm. this is a perfect time to be doing all these things. It's a perfect time to start to start. So our big quote for the day is, there are seven days in the week and someday isn't one of them. Bottom line, there's no reason not to wait till tomorrow or someday, you need to start now. 
If we're here to help and motivate you, we're here to help and motivate you. So we're here. Peace out.